All right, so we will get started. So last but not least, talk mm -hmm. of this session, um, we have Allison Adams, master's student here at the University of Vermont Brutusing School, also working with Dr. Jennifer Honius. Um, she is a graduate student fellow at the Gund Institute for Ecological Economics. She studies changing land cover and forest composition in the Northeast and the associated impacts on the provision of ecosystem services. Thanks, Kathleen, um, and thanks everybody for being here. So I want to start by saying that this presentation is um, on a, a part of a much larger project. So those of you who are here for David's talk, um, this is part of calculating um, how carbon storage is affected by changing land over cover in the Northeast over the past 30 years. Um, so that's a project I'm sort of working on over time over my, in my master's, and I need to know how am I actually going to calculate carbon storage and, um, at that large of a scale. And so this is a project to take a look at different methods for doing that and figure out which ones sort of give me the best results. So why carbon? This is a story that I think is pretty familiar to everybody in this room. Um, given climate change and uh, managing to mitigate climate change, we need to know where carbon is stored and how much carbon is stored. Um, also given that climate change is likely to affect species distributions all over the world, we need to know again, where that carbon is stored and how that might change in order to make informed management decisions about how we manage our forests. Um, and also, carbon is a huge part of how ecosystems function and a big part of nutrient cycling, and so we need to know where carbon is in those ecosystems in order to better understand and manage those ecosystems. And then the other part of this story is that the methods that we have right now to measure carbon at a landscape scale are either pretty inaccurate and heterogeneous landscapes or pretty expensive. So one way you can do that is using forest inventory data. And forest inventory data, a lot of people here are probably familiar with it, but it's just a point, you know, it's a plot. And in order to measure carbon across a whole landscape, then you need to interpolate between those points. So if you have a heterogeneous landscape like we do here in the Northeast, this can be pretty inaccurate. Another way to do it is to take land cover maps and use different land cover types and car standard carbon values for those land cover types in order to calculate how much carbon is stored across that entire landscape. Um, this, can be, this can work well, the problem is that most land cover maps that we have are pretty coarse. So NLCD has categories in forests for deciduous, evergreen, and mixed. Um, a lot of other land cover maps just say forests. So if you want to look at a more regional scale and see how things change um, on a smaller, you know, looking at a couple of states or a region, this isn't going to help you very much. Um, the last thing you could do is use a remotely sensed biomass map. One of these came out from Woods Hole a couple of years ago, and that's what this is a clip from. And those can be great. They do show heterogeneity in the forest on a scale like this. The problem is that they rely on a confluence of lots of different sources of data all at the same time. Um, one of those is usually actively remote set, remotely sensed data, which may not be available everywhere. It might not be available for your studying. It's not going to be available for lots of regular time steps, so it's hard to replicate this over multiple time steps, and it can be really expensive and get to the data at all. So we're looking really at improving this second step. If we have a better land cover map, are we able to improve our carbon storage estimates? So what land cover data am I going to use? Well, this, is, this was sort of the crux of David's talk, and so I'm not going to get into it in a lot of detail. But um, David, Jen, and I a little bit have been mapping working on mapping basal area, relative basal area, across the northern forest region. So we're using Landsat data. These three yellow squares are the, those three <coughs> Landsat tiles that we're using. Um, and we're using advanced remote sensing techniques to come up with maps that show a scale of infeasibility to feasibility for every given common species in the northeast. So this is sugar maple. Um, red areas are where sugar maple is likely present. Teal areas are where it's likely absent, and white areas are where it's likely a false positive. And again, this is a scale, this is in a categorical map. And then this is sort of an intermediate step. This then goes through a few other steps to come up with a map of relative basal area for each species. And that red square, that's path 14. That's what I run my carbon models on. So what I wanted to know is, given this data, are we able to improve our carbon storage estimates? while maintaining the spatial scale of some of those larger land cover maps. Um, so looking at the northern forest region and also representing the heterogeneity of the, the northern forest. The other thing I want to know is, does this matter? Um, do you actually get additional information or different information from including this data? Do other people need to go to the trouble of mapping relative basal area in order to compute carbon across the landscape? 
So how am I going to calculate carbon? So I'm using a spatial modeling program called Dynamica. This is just a quick shot of what um, a sort of simple model might look like in Dynamica. Dynamica is really geared for doing land use change mapping, but it's also really easy to use for things like this. So it's what I decided to use. I'm not going to make you guys look at this. Instead, I'm going to break it down a little differently. So I'm running three different models. One is really honing in on that those relative basal area maps and taking advantage of that data. So I have a relative basal area map for each species. There are 11 species that we're using. And those will give you, so for sugar maple, say in this pixel it's 0.7 sugar maple, and this other pixel it's 0.10, I mean 0.1. Um, and I'm using these, um, the, these, are, these tables are a little representation of Smith 2006 carbon tables. So they break down carbon by stand age, region, species association, so you have ones for maple, beech, birch, aspen, birch, um, oak, hickories, things like that, um, and also carbon pool. So I'm for this run of these models, I'm only using above ground biomass. Um, I'll bring in other pools later on. So the way this model works is that it looks at the, the um, species, the relative basal area for the species, of, for every given species, also looks at the stand age in that pixel, and then we'll look up the appropriate carbon storage value and apply that to that species, or uh, create a weighted sum and apply that to that pixel. Um, one quick note on the stand age map: this is zoomed in to, you know, this is, this is two miles here, so this is just a little portion of it. But the stand age map comes in one kilometer pixels, and it's really, really clumpy. So you'll see in all of my outputs that you get this sort of clumpy result. To try and mitigate that a little bit, that also had a standard deviation map, and so I um, picked a random number from a standard deviation for each pixel to make it look a little bit more heterogeneous and a little more representative of what forest might actually look like. So that's the first model. The second model is sort of trying to get a middle ground between those really coarse classifications and using something as specific as relative basal area. So based on those relative basal area maps, I assigned a dominant species to each pixel, which was simply which species has the most basal area in that pixel. Again, I use the stand age map, same carbon tables, and assigned a carbon, pixel, a carbon value to each pixel. And then the last one I did was just create a forest, non-forest map. So using this, it's the exact same extent of forest. It, it didn't get a value if it didn't have a value in the previous um, maps, and then just used carbon values from the IPCC. So there are two values from IPCC that are relevant in Vermont. One is temperate forest continental, and one is temperate forest mountain. And so I ran it for both of them just to get a low bound and a high bound. So these are the results that I got. Um, I think the big thing that jumps out here is that including any species information and probably also standard information since that was there as well, gives you a much higher estimate of carbon than the one forest type estimates based on IPCC data. So again, this, this hasn't, I haven't compared this to any actual data yet um, on the ground data, so we don't know which one is accurate, but it's important to know that they're different. There is actually a difference between these two things. I wanted to put error bars on these, but because of the number of pixels, the statistical power here is really, really high, and the error bars are, if they're not visible here. So, um, but there is about a 10% difference even within the, between the species, the two different ways of, of incorporating species. So then looking spatially at these results, this is a map of relative basal area. The calculation is based on relative basal area. You can't really see them, but the bright green is high and the red is low. And then this is, just for comparison, this is what you get if you use one forest type. You're going to get one carbon value across the entire landscape. That is not realistic if you're looking at doing something on the scale, even just one single state. And then this is dominant species. I can flip back and forth between those two. They're pretty similar. Spatially, they look about the same. Um, it's just that the values are a little different between the two pixels, I mean the two maps. But the areas that are low for dominant species are also, sorry, are also low for relative basal area, and that the high pixels are also high. And then this is just zoomed in, just showing this basically the same thing, but one forest type. Again, it's a little obvious, but it gives you one carbon value across the entire landscape. You get something that looks a little bit more representative of the northern forest when you include species information and stand age information. And this is just comparing relative basal area and dominant species calculations. So in general, what happens is if you add species distribution information and stand age, um, you get a spatial pattern that better reflects the heterogeneity of the northern forest. Um, and by including the relative basal areas, you generate higher carbon storage estimates. 
and using just the general forest class and our carbon values might be underestimating the amount of carbon stored at the landscape scale. So they're different, and the specificity of the maps might matter. So what's next? Um, this is what I have to do next. I have to do an accuracy assessment to see which one is better. Um, I'm going to take these three maps that I have and compare them to plot information from BMC. These are not the actual sites, but they're about that many, to see which one's sort of accurately calculated carbon. Um, I, uh, David and Jen are also working on refining the relative basal area map, so they might be a little bit better. I'll include non-forest non land cover types, just based on MLCE, and include those in my carbon calculations, and also include the additional carbon pools. Um, I'm inclined to say that, say that including the standage information is really what's making a big difference in the spatial pattern. Um, I, that said, though, there isn't a good way to include the standage information without the more specific species information. So you, can, you kind of have to do both. I haven't found a set of data that's just like general carbon stored but broken down by standage. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so what's the plan for... Um, including all the other pools. So, <laughs> like, like say, the soils, for instance. So, um, so I'm, not, I'm not sure I know what you mean by the plan. So the Smith tables have pools. Okay, so for, that's, yeah, that's part it's of just a matter of including more of them. But for the purposes of comparing methods, I wanted to just use above ground biomass because a lot of things just compute above ground biomass. And okay. if I wanted to compare to other data sets like that remotely sensed biomass map, um, that only is above ground. And so okay. I wanted to be able to do that. And will you, you're going to use the VMC plots for for validation, mm -hmm. essentially, and they have those pools as well, of course, 40 degree and, and soil data as well? No, they don't. So, yeah, yeah so, <laughs> right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to validate the points, val validate the models based on above ground biomass, and then make the assumption that whatever one's best is going to do the best job overall. There are no other questions. We can wrap up.